All right. All right. Well, um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk so, about the debate tonight, right? Uh, what debate? Democrat debate <laughs> and everything that's going on with that. Uh, why are you in space, by the way? <laughs> What's wrong with space? Uh, there's nothing wrong with space. It's just I did not expect space. <laughs> well, I can be in San Francisco, too. It's fine. We can do that. Ah! <laughs> Liberal Reinhold. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hey, welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. So nice to be back in the studio and here with you guys. Uh, we have quite the show coming up. We're going to be talking about the Kurds and Syria and everything that is happening there. Uh, we were going to talk about Ukraine and impeachment, but it just seems like people dying. Trump's errant phone calls. So stay tuned. We'll have more right after this disclaimer. Oops. Lie after lie. All right, everybody, welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle, as I mentioned. Uh, I am so glad to be back in the studio. I was in Dallas for a week and recorded some great shows while I was there and turn this down a little bit. I uh, recorded some great programs while I was there. And uh, so we haven't been in the studio in a while. Harry's not been in the studio forever. Uh, Harry, how are you doing? Going good, going good. Uh, no audio on my headset other than your, you know, voice, but that's okay. You know, uh, That's probably because I need to push that button, but I don't know that we're listening to anything else. But uh, yeah, thank you for being quiet. You're not usually uh, quiet. So very, very glad to, to, I almost made you come here tonight because even though uh, it is 69 degrees in here, which I know is still below your desired temperature of 78, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the traffic is mostly gone, even though they inexplicably just shut down an interstate this morning and said, hey, by the way, we're just closing 465 for the morning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the traffic is almost done. So Harry almost came to the studio tonight, but then Dennis, or I mean, excuse me, Reinhold, uh, sorry, didn't mean to uh, dead name you there, uh, was, I was like, hey, let's have a party, let's get together, and then you, you dropped out, Reinhold, and so I just said, Harry, just stay home, you know. We'll get together in a week or two. and It's my fault. It's, I'm blaming you. That's, no, you're right. It is your fault. Yeah, we, we all know the truth. So it's so, so good also, to be back. Also, do the fans understand that I still haven't signed my 2020 wall contract yet because we're still having arguments over temperature. I did cave on 78 degrees and I moved to 75. Right, which I denied and said it will never be above 70 unless it's January through March when I keep it a 72. Uh, so, I mean, what, after, I don't know what it is, but like after January 1st, I get super cold and then I can't get warm enough. But like I'm wearing shorts until like January 1st mm. and then it just gets too cold. So who's chipping in on the heated blanket to make this happen? Well, so here's the funny thing. Uh, our buddy Jason Doolittle uh, sent a blanket for Harry and Harry has never touched it, but me... And several special guests uh, to the apartment have snuggled in that blanket a lot. So, so make sure you get a one of those blue lights. <laughs> no, and check it out first. There's, there's no f fecal material or seed issue on that particular blanket. So, um, uh, I do want to thank Jason. He sent me two cartridges of printer ink, and then somebody I didn't see. There wasn't a note in there who sent another two cartridges of Canon. Uh, cartridge 137 for the old printer, but I've got my uh, I've got my stack of stuff here. Uh, thanks to uh, those sending cartridges and and paper and everything. So very important. I read off of paper. I print a lot of stuff out, and so thank you to the person who 
uh, has remained anonymous to me for sending me that gift. I just want to say that. I want to, uh, right up top, right up front, uh, I want to say a special thank you to our patrons. Um, you know, you guys, uh, you guys have kept me in the game. Even with there, I, I have always been open that there's at least a couple times a year where I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I don't want to read the news. I'm tired. Uh, but I, I, the patronage really keeps me accountable. And I greatly appreciate it. And I just finished my taxes because I wait till the very last minute to pay the government. Uh, so I filed an extension and I just did my taxes. We Are Libertarians made roughly $15,000 in 2018. And we spent roughly $18,000. Uh, so we had a $3,000 loss. Uh, and uh, listen, if you think $5 a month, if you get something out of this program, if you appreciate We Are Libertarians, and you learn something and you enjoy the content that we put out, you, you, it makes you think about the world in a different way, please consider financially supporting us. Because if $5, $10, $25, $100 dollars sounds like a lot to you, it's costing me a little over $200 a month to do this. Uh, now, Lord knows I'm not the best businessman, but uh, yeah, we had, that's just sort of how it goes. Like I think anybody who runs a small business understands the cost of doing business, but uh, your patronage, it goes towards a lot of stuff. It goes, last year it went to trips. Uh, mainly it went to hosting. We spend the vast majority of our money on website and podcast and uh, all kinds of different hostings and email hosting and, um, you know, plugins and all kinds, just all kinds of stuff. There's just, there is way more to running. So if you start a podcast with your friends, you know, and, and then there's equipment upgrades. We, we had several thousand dollars worth of equipment that we had to, had to replace and keep up because we want to actually sound good. So when you are a patron, your money does go somewhere. It does get used. It, it is not spent on fancy dinners. It is not spent frivolously. I make no money off of We Are Libertarians. It's a labor of love. I thought I made money off of We Are Libertarians, and then I did my taxes this year. Uh, so... If $5 a month sounds like a lot to you, then it's, it's the, the burden that I bear is much greater. Um, but I, so I appreciate everybody that does help offset the cost. Because we are running a deficit, I had to close down several things. I shut down some feeds. I want to formally and publicly apologize to anyone who uh, subscribes to several of our feeds. You may have noticed that uh, you got several hundred uh, We Are Libertarians episodes in your podcast feed. I apologize. That was a function of closing down some of the newer feeds that, frankly, just weren't getting used very regularly. And I decided to just put them back into the main feed. And uh, we closed down We Are Libertarians radio at the end of October. That will cease to be. It stinks. There's a few. There's almost a thousand people a month that listen to We Are Libertarians radio on their Am on their uh, uh, Android app and on. Uh, Apple Radio and TuneIn Radio, but it costs a lot to run, and uh, we're not we're not you know we're at a deficit, and I'm not the federal government, so we're we're closing that down. So when we do not have Patreon donations, we have to start cutting things back uh, and tighten our belt. So I do want to thank Matthew Durbin. Um, you know, I just opened up the Patreon here because I always love to thank early in the episode our $100 a month contributors like Ed Brehob, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, Craig DaCosta, and Jeff Bennett. Jeff uh, has, has a new, been a newer fellow uh, donating to the Patreon. Man, I'm hip uh, fellow. Uh, Matthew Durbin joined this month, and so it is very cool to have Matthew Durbin join us, and we want to thank him uh, for joining uh, the Patreon, and uh, thank you to everybody that just helps pay the bills. So, you know, we have several different shows and we have a lot of hosting costs because we are a bigger podcast. And here's the thing about hosting. You can go cheaper, but because of the size of what we do, if we pull too many resources, they shut us down. You saw that happen to our friends over at Lions of Liberty on the terrible Podbean. Don't ever use Podbean. Oof. We use Fireside.fm, which is about the cheapest that I can find that gives the best quality service. I love Fireside.fm. Uh, so, that is uh, just a little bit of a plug. I want to thank those patrons and thank everybody that donates to the Patreon and lets you know that we are using your money well. I have been a little insecure about it because I have not been doing the live show live 
uh, these last um, this last month. We had several recorded shows. When I was in Dallas, Frank Caliendo, yes, the Frank Caliendo, said, hey, can I come on your podcast? And who am I to say no to Frank Caliendo? And uh, then Al Jackson heard about it, and he was like, can I come on your podcast? And who am I to turn down Al Jackson? That will be next week's show, and it is stellar. It is one of the best podcasts. I really think those three shows that I did in Dallas were some of the best podcasts that we've ever done, even if they were pre-recorded. Um, you'll really enjoy it. I think, I think as a man, as a man, Reinhold and Harry, I think you both will enjoy listening to the Al Jackson podcast. Um, he really, uh, I've seen Al grow up. He's a 42 year old man who grew up in the last year and he talks a lot about that. And it's just really a great conversation uh, about that and about race and uh, some other things. But I don't know if either of you listened to it. The reviews and the comments about my conversation with Robin Brown about the JFK assassination, this has been the most uh, feedback that I have gotten from an episode in years. People, I, I knew it. As I was just like, I've got to talk to this guy. The audience will love this guy. He's so engaging. I may even do like a telephone interview with him because I've got more questions and you guys really enjoyed hearing from him so much. Did either of you get a chance to listen to the Robin Brown conversation about JFK? No, I downloaded it wrong. On I was planning on listening on Saturday when I was working out, and it didn't download correctly. Something well, you, happened. you will get jacked. Because the feed's all messed up. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I actually listened to it, um, uh, I think, a week ago. Uh, so, What would you think? It's okay it was, it was entertaining, um, to, to say the least. The guy uh, is very entertaining to listen to. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, like, I'm not saying that I believe what he believes. Right. But I found him so fun <clears throat> in the yeah. tour that I went on that I was just like, I would just want people to hear this guy. Like, it was, it was fun to listen to. I listened to it twice. There's not a lot of people who can tell stories like that. Like, they can keep yeah. you engaged and just tell you these stories, and you just, you just sit there and you, you're waiting for the next. Um, next thing out of his mouth to the point where you go, okay, it's been, how long have I been listening to this? It only feels like 15 minutes. I want to keep listening to that. So yeah. that, I think that's really good to have somebody who can, who can really engage like that. I had talked to him for three hours, but I had to catch my plane. I needed to eat before I got on the plane. And so I, I just made my flight, uh, but I could have kept talking. Honestly, I had to pee really bad and and I'm, you know, he's 65, so I'm sure he had to pee if I'm 35 and had to pee that bad. And we had sat on this uncomfortable wooden bench outside of that library in the Texas heat for three hours. So I was just like, I, I've got two more hours in me uh, of questions, but I know we need to be done because he was already gracious enough, but really fun conversation. If you didn't listen to it, Reinhold, my main goal with that was not necessarily the Kennedy assassination stuff. My secret sneaky goal was to get you to click listen on the conspiracy stuff. But really, mainly I wanted you to think about the military industrial complex and its development by listening to that episode. And I, that's why we spent a lot of time in the beginning talking about it. Um, and so hopefully, I don't know, hopefully we did a good job of kind of getting people to think differently about our, our, the way that our militaristic uh, society has kind of developed over the last hundred years. I thought he did a good job of explaining some of that stuff. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll go fuck myself then. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think he did a good job of that. I mean, that's, that's something that I think libertarians have caught on to a long time, you know, a while back, but it's, it's not something that most people, most uh, Americans really think about too much. Yeah, and it's it's something we really need to understand is that a lot of the decisions that are made we think are made for uh, altruistic reasons or trying to you know uh, be nice to the world to take and take care of people, but it's it's just driven by the the complex wanting to keep itself running and keep itself growing and keep itself in business. Yeah, I think that is a great transition into tonight's topic, talking about uh, Kurdistan and Syria and Iran and. Uh, and everything that we're kind of talking about, I want to just start because um, this is a this is a very layered story. Uh, 
And, and I think as we try to give nuance to a very layered story, there's going to be people that might misinterpret us. And I don't want them to misinterpret us. Everybody on this program tonight is firmly non-interventionist, correct? That is correct. Correct. How in the hell, Harry, have you not fixed that fucking smoke detector? Um, first off, battery's not dead yet, okay? It's been beeping that way for like five plus years. It's a staple of the Cyberlifting Studio. <laughs> it's a staple now. So irritating. You next, next time when you come to the studio, which will probably be in like, what, February, I'm going to just open all the windows. And let you see that. <laughs> I'll just I'll bring it with me then. So we are firmly non-interventionist. We are not non-interventionist because Donald Trump is president. We were non-interventionist when both Bush and well, <laughs> I became non-interventionist when Bush was president, but didn't start the administration that way. Um, but so I want to kind of frame this uh, in. It, 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 by reading something from Jacob Hornberger over at the Future Freedom Foundation, FFF.org, and I'll put this in the show notes. Uh, it's very short, um, and, and, and I think it kind of frames the bigger picture. Let's just zoom out on the Curtis story. And what we're going to do tonight, we have great show notes written by an anonymous person who is an active military contributor to We Are Libertarians who we will not identify. They wrote great notes for us um, and spent a lot of time researching this but also inputting their particular knowledge so we don't sound stupid because i've not been in the military no harry wasn't dennis i mean reinhold i'm so sorry uh reinhold you were in the military were you not i was in the navy for several years and was uh so you uh, weren't in the military you were just in the navy yeah <laughs> I'm, from a marine, I'm from a marine family i had to do that uh, yeah that's the marines are the ones we drop off on the beach pull back and shell the beach because that's <laughs> that's what we do but um, so yeah, I'm a disabled vet technically from the, from the military, from the Navy. Right. But it so, was back, but it was back in the, uh, mid to late eighties where we really weren't doing a lot. Uh, we, we had a few things going on with Beirut and that sort of thing, but for the most part, Reagan didn't have us doing the kind of stuff that we're doing now. Compared to uh, the Bushes. Yeah, no, yeah. Not, yeah. The Navy specifically, you guys are, are, is the Navy in charge of the drone program or is that the air? Force? I think it's the air force. Okay. In charge of the drones. Um, but uh, I want to zoom back. So we're going to explain who the Kurds are. This is your primer on it. And what we like to do is just kind of explain the news to you so you understand what's going on. So we're going to explain who the Kurds are, what's going on in this region of the world, what happened with Donald Trump, why it is important, and uh, what we think about it. And hopefully through that, you'll understand things a little bit better and make up your own mind about what you think about it. Um, but I want to start with the 10,000 foot view from Jacob Hornberger who wrote so well today on FFF.org. Uh, he says, not surprisingly, the interventionists are blaming their latest interventionist fiasco, this one in Syria, on President Trump. No, they say the responsibility doesn't fall on them and their morally bankrupt philosophy. The fault for their interventionist fiascos always lies with others. If only President Trump hadn't betrayed the Kurds, if only he had kept those 50 troops who were serving as sacrificial tripwire to prevent war between Turkey and the Kurds there for the next 30 years, if only he had sent tens of thousands of more troops into Syria for regime, regime change, if only, if only, if only, the interventionists could have finally had an intervention success story. But now that Trump has acted, quote, precipitously by moving those 50 troops and announcing a withdrawal, of the 1,000 U.S. troops in the country. He has eliminated any chance of an interventionist success story. It's all his fault for the latest failure and fiasco. Of course, we heard this interventionist tripe after the fiasco in Vietnam. If only those anti-war protesters hadn't been having those massive demonstrations. If only the military wasn't required to fight with one hand tied behind its back. If only the civilian sector hadn't interfered with the war effort. If only we had nuked Hanoi and the rest of North Vietnam. If only, if only, if only U.S. troops could still be fighting, killing, dying, and destroying in Vietnam today. Make no mistake about it, despite their latest fiasco in Syria, the interventionists are not about to give up. Their first interventionist success story is always just around the corner. Iran, Venezuela, Korea, maybe even possibly back to Vietnam. Hope springs eternal for the interventionists. They simply will not give up their dream 
of their first interventionist success story and are willing to wreak, wreck, and incur, incur any amount of death, suffering, destruction, spending debt, and loss of liberty in the attempt to achieve it. And so a lot of the making of the story that we are talking about today didn't just start under Obama, but we'll start in near history. Uh, and as we go through the notes, we'll work our way back. But if you look at what is the conversation today, which is ISIS fighters being released, well, how was ISIS created? Uh, uh, during the Arab Spring, as Arab governments began to fall, Assad decided that he would hold on to his power instead of just letting go and held on rather ruthlessly and has been responsible for the deaths of most people in Syria, uh, not not just, uh, you know, obviously Americans, Russians, Turks, Iranians, Kurds, uh, Saudi Arabians, Israelis, they all play some part in deaths in, in Syria, but the, the Assad government has, has killed the majority of those people. And so the American government under Obama, supported by John McCain and other interventionists, a person that believes in U.S. military supremacy propping up, quote unquote, peace, in multiple countries and conflicts around the world. Um, they, they armed Syrian rebels to fight Assad, and eventually they said, you know what, I don't think I want to fight Assad anymore. Let's just start our own caliphate, and moved into eastern Syria, northern Iraq, Kurdistan, as I will call it, uh, and that's when the Islamic State and basically Iraq War III uh, started over the last over towards the end of the Barack Obama administration. And they were largely quelled because of all the regional and global powers participating in the Syrian conflict. And because the United States, if you look at ISIS fighters, many of them were driving brand new Toyota trucks. Well, where they got those trucks, American uh, supplies, there was also maybe some Supplies secretly moving through Benghazi when they were attacked. That was a gun running port uh, up to those Syrian rebels. Um, the American government had a part to play in creating ISIS. Did they obviously sit down and say, here's what we'd like you to do? No, but they gave the trucks and the arms and the weapons. And there were a portion of Syrian rebels that did fight Assad, but there were a portion that left and uh, tried to start their own caliphate. And why this Syrian civil war has become important is that Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Iran are fighting uh, for basically regional uh, premiership and, and power in the region. And all three of them are fighting in Syria because it is a, is a base of operations. And the Russians, are base, the Russians and China are basically backing Iran and the Turks and Assad. And the Americans are largely backing the, uh, the Kurds. The Kurds have been our best partner in the fight against ISIS because they have the majority of the fighters and the intelligence have come from the Kurdish forces there in that, in that region, uh, as well as some Syrian rebels. So it's very complicated. That's why you get American bombers killing hundred Rus hundreds of Russian soldiers at one point because Iran and Lebanon and Israel and everybody's participating in the Syrian war. And the same thing is happening in Yemen as well. So that's kind of your, your primer of what exactly is happening there in Syria. Um, Harry, Reinhold, did I get anything wrong as I kind of like worked through a lot of that? No, that sounds about right. It's pretty par for the course on a lot of these groups that have started up like, you know, ISIS and uh, Al Qaeda and all the other little groups that come up because they're trying to fight imperialism. Uh, imagine this United States has had something to do with getting those people upset enough to do those things. Right. So, um, so to, to go back to Hornberger's original point, uh, and, and maybe we can kind of discuss this just a little bit if, if you guys want to weigh in on Horn, Horn, Hornberger's point, is that we can be mad at Trump, and I am mad at Trump, and I do feel that this in a lot of ways was a negative for non-interventionist foreign policy, and I'll explain why uh, through the course of the show. Um, I, I, I'm always in favor of us removing troops 
but at the same time, like the way that Donald Trump did it was just egregious. But we're having this conversation because the ruling foreign policy that we kind of talked about in the JFK episode in that in that first chunk is one that has just continually failed. And the reason that we had these thousand troops in northern Syria was basically as a tripwire because the Turkish government, the Iranians, the Russians, and everybody else isn't going to do what they want, which is move into this area and wipe out the Kurds. It's to prevent that by having the American presence because the second the Turks roll in and start trying to fight American soldiers, well, then you have a hot war. And so the interventionists basically propose that we're just going to, in perpetuity, keep those soldiers there. Now, Donald Trump basically has been a big proponent of drawing down in foreign entanglements. And he really said strongly in December, I'm going to start um, drawing down these troops. And that is why James Mattis uh, resigned. And so there is a bit, it is funny, Reinhold, that you look at Justin Amash saying essentially, uh, this don't be fooled, we're not leaving, we're not ending any wars. And Rand Paul saying this is a great victory for non-interventionism. It is funny how two libertarians and several libertarians can kind of all look. I, I sort of subscribe to the Scott Horton school, which is, eh, it's not really good. It's pretty effed up, but that's just sort of normal. Well, yeah, and that's the way I looked at it was it's great to see us starting to get out of some of these areas, these uh, theaters of war that we shouldn't really be in, but we created a lot of the messes that are there to begin with. So it's kind of, it's kind of uh, not really a good thing to say, okay, we created this mess. Now we're just going to bail, you know, see you later, you know, leave somebody else with the check right. as it were, but leaving is good. As, we have to, at some point leave, we have to at some point say, we're not going to be involved in your, you know, your issues anymore, but you have to do it the right way. And what really frustrates me is that this was done so badly that it makes all non-interventionist policy look like pure chaos. Like this is what you guys, when you say you'd want to be isolationist or non-interventionist, this is the result that's going to happen every time we try to do that. Right. Um, so yeah. it just puts a big stain on it, on the things that we're trying to get done to save people's lives and to make, bring peace to the world uh, by making things worse. Uh, yeah, it could do that route. The other route it could possibly take is the the show the you know then that like, hey this is what the you know Trump wants to do. He wants to pull these people out. You either create a plan to make this correct, or this is this is the, this is the ugly route he's going to take. This he's proven that he will take this ugly route. The yeah. unfortunate the, the, the of the situation is allowing other people to understand more of what's going on with the region. It is refret. It stinks that to have people to really to have this conversation of what's happening over there because they're not understanding. I've so many different people trying to tell, ask me where the heck is Kurdistan on the map. And I just kind of like, okay, this is going to get, this is going to be a long talk. Let's go get some coffee. You know, yeah, we've got a hundred years of history that we need to go through in order to get you up to speed here. <laughs> we, we will once we get to the Kurds, but I want people to kind of understand maybe why Donald Trump made the decision that he made. And I want to play a piece from the New York times, the daily podcast. Oh. Uh, called Is the U.S. Betraying Its Kurdish Allies? Uh, and forgive me, YouTubers, I am going to uh, basically kind of scroll because I didn't prep. Uh, I just decided I wanted to play this because it's so well thought From the out. New York Times, I'm Michael Bavar. Which would undermine many of the national security goals the United States has in the region. So the Kurds and the Turks are sworn enemies, but they are both allies of the United States. So what has been play? A couple of years and hand a moral victory, if not an actual territorial victory, to some of the United States' key enemies in the region. Well, Eric, I wonder if you could just step way back and explain the dynamics here, the forces at play, and how we get to this decision by President Trump. What exactly is going on here? It's all right, so this is the daily check. So, Eric, out. I wonder if you could just step way back and explain the dynamics here, the forces at play, 
and how we get to this decision by President Trump. What exactly is going on here? At the heart of this are really the Kurds. This is a stateless people, and they represent a significant minority in the southeastern part of Turkey. And Turkey sees them as a terrorist group within their own country. Mm -hmm. But the Kurds are also a very important ally, or at least some of the Kurds are, in Syria. They're a key ally of the United States in its fight against the Islamic State in that area. The problem for the United States is how to balance these two partners. One, the stateless entity, the Kurds, who are terrific fighters, who prove their mettle in basically kicking ISIS out of northeastern Syria, but are the arch enemy of the Turks. The Turks, however, are a long time, decades old NATO ally that the United States relies on and has relied on for a long time. It forms a very essential part of security in the region. And the problem for the United States, they're caught in the middle of this, trying to manage them both to keep them from clashing, which would undermine many of the national security goals the United States has in the region. So the Kurds and the Turks are sworn enemies, but they are both allies of the United States. So what has been the U.S. policy for navigating those tensions? The United States has tried to distinguish between the Kurds who are in Turkey and the Kurds who are in northeastern Syria fighting on behalf of the United States. Mm -hmm. Turkey, however, continues to believe this is a fiction. Kurds are Kurds. They're all enemies of Turkey. Hmm. And they've pushed the United States to let them come after Kurds in northern Syria. The United States said, no, no, lay off, leave them alone. And up to now, the Turks have basically had to honor that. They haven't dared challenge the United States military that's there. So as long as American troops are there, the sense is that this conflict will not actually blow up. The U.S. will somehow kind of keep everybody in their corners. That's right. And that's the way it had been up until last December. There will be a strong, deliberate, and orderly withdrawal of U.S. forces from Syria. Very deliberate, very orderly. Ah. In December, President Trump ordered all 2,000 American forces in Syria out immediately. Immediately, you had the Turkish defense minister talking about massacring the Syrian Kurds, which mm -hmm. the Turkish uh, government views as terrorists. These are the same forces that had been protecting the Syrian Kurds. And suddenly the U.S. was just walking away, basically leaving them at the mercy of the Turkish army. And this withdrawal triggered outrage. We in this Congress and we as a nation are going to be dealing with the consequences of it for years to come. Not only among Democrats, but among Republicans, among allies who are totally blindsided by the president's announcement. This is a disaster in the making. All of his military advisors have said, we need to leave uh, troops in Syria to work with the Kurds. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, angry that the allies had been blindsided by the president's lack of consultation with this decision resigned in protest. In his letter of resignation uh, to Mr. Trump, uh, Secretary Mattis wrote that he was leaving because, quote, you have a right to have a secretary of defense whose views are better aligned with yours. To join that. And Eric, what about the Kurds? What was their reaction to the U.S. starting to draw down these troops and seemingly start to walk away from them? Well, you can imagine they were furious. This was an ally they thought that was standing beside them, that had stood beside them for years now mm -hmm. against Turkey. And suddenly, without any notice at all, they were going to lose their buffer. So despite this backlash, does President Trump move forward with this decision to pull back the troops? Well, yes and no. Here's what's interesting. The president basically overruled all his national security advisors who couldn't believe this had happened. But what happened next was over the next several months, the aides tried to figure out a way to slow down the withdrawal, to mitigate its effects so there wouldn't be this very abrupt pullout of American troops mm -hmm. on the ground in Syria. Because they essentially disagreed with it or thought that the pace the president outlined was unproductive. That's right. The trick was how do you do this without the boss knowing about it and getting angry that his orders aren't being followed. So by late March, the force had come down to about 1,000 troops. And then the military's plan was basically to pause there rather than to continue further and just not talk about it a whole lot, hoping the president wouldn't focus on the extent 
to which the American military was continuing its operations there. And always telling him whenever he asked that we are on a plan to draw down. And they were. They are eventually going to do it. They just maybe weren't going to do it at the pace that the president initially thought about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's Eric Schmidt, who's the national security reporter for the New York Times. I find that particular clip, uh, it's scary that, like, we all manage up, right? Like, everybody has a boss that they kind of manage up. Everybody has a boss where you kind of go, um, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll just kind of sweep them. I have a boss that had an idea last week where we're kind of like, let's hope he forgets about that one. Um, and you have to kind of just directly say, no, this isn't a great idea. And if we did that, he would, he would, but with Trump, he doesn't seem to do that. This has been a repetitive, continuous problem in the Trump administration that Donald Trump will say to do something and the people around him will, tr will ignore his orders and will kind of hope that he doesn't actually want to do that. He'll forget about it. This happened with Nixon a lot. Haldeman once said that, uh, his chief of staff that, or he had told Buchanan, Pat Buchanan, that uh, when the old man tells you something twice, that's when you do something about it. Uh, so this happens with all presidents. It's happened, I've heard stories of Bush and Obama, but uh, this is the national security apparatus disobeying the orders of the president, which were pretty direct. And it lends credibility to the non-interventionist argument that it doesn't matter what the president says, they're always going to try and find a way around it, disobe disobey those orders, and they're never going to be serious about actually pulling out. I found that particular section of that podcast very scary and very concerning for a multitude of reasons. First, no one thinks Donald Trump, Trump is credible. <laughs> which who does, unless you're in a cult. And second, it doesn't matter what the president says, we're going to ignore that order. That sounds like a bit of a constitutional crisis to me. I mean, am I overreacting? Is my Trump derangement syndrome kicking in? Right? <laughs> well, the problem is, is that Trump has ordered his people to do so many crazy things that they've not done because of, A, it's insane, uh, like, let's shoot immigrants in the legs as they're trying to, to come across the border. Let's, right. let's put gators in the, in the, <laughs> in the rivers, you know, those sorts of things that he was insistent on. He made him go and actually look up how much it would cost to do all this stuff. When they push back, he said, no, you're going to go do it. So there's so many things that comes out um, that I think if his administration did everything he said for them to do, he would have, uh, McGahn would have fired Mueller. He would have been in a bigger constitutional crisis there uh, as opposed to just uh, attempted obstruction. He would have had uh, real obstruction. And then just, just all the other insane things he says. So at some point, I think that the aides and the people around him start to try to try to protect the office more than they are trying to protect or do what the president says to do. Um, so there's a conflict, I think, in their heads in that area. But at some point, you have to say it's his decision to make and we have to follow through with it. And if you're not willing to do that, walk away like Mattis did. Walk away from it. And eventually enough people leave and he's going to have to come to terms with the fact that he's, he's asking for too many crazy things. Uh, he's just not being reasonable about any of the stuff that he's trying to trying to do. But it's just so many things that he says just off the top of his head that he doesn't, like you said with Nixon, he just, we should do this, or we should do that, or we should take care of this. And then he keeps on it, unlike Nixon, who would forget about it. He keeps at it because he just can't understand how his ideas aren't the best ideas. Right. Perfect ideas. It, and, and what sucks is that this particular <clears throat> idea is actually a good idea. <laughs> right. And that's what sucks, Harry, is that like when he does have a good idea, everybody goes, well, that's a bad idea. Well, it's, it's a good idea, but is the implementation of the idea? No, the right. way, that, that's he's the handled, the way yeah. that he's handled this completely has been like, I, I don't know if you guys heard, I heard on a podcast somewhere, I don't, ha I don't know if it's in the notes, um, that he didn't even tell the, the U.S. military commanders in the region what was going on. He didn't tell anybody in the local area what was going on. One, you know, American military special forces were occupying like these 
towers and kind of makeshift barriers and uh, on the front lines. And then one day they just get up, pack up and leave. They don't tell the people on the ground where they're going. And the Kurds in the local area are completely baffled until they start hearing news reports later on. If you're only- going, if you're going to do what he did, you, you, you have a discussion with your military commanders. You have them go and talk to the local populations. You prepare for a withdrawal. Mm-hmm. There was zero prepare, uh, preparedness. Not only that, he was sharing military intelligence from the Kurds with the Turks. And, and right. it was basically an implicit go ahead, slaughter, these, slaughter our allies uh, in the fight against ISIS so you can take this territory. It's really... Yeah, the only people who had enraged. advanced warning of any of this stuff was Turkey. Right. Yeah. And and there's there's suggestions that um we gave Turkey information on where the Kurds were at. Which is yeah. So go get them. And so why I believe this is bad for non-interventionists, it's because we are painted as reckless. We are painted as if we leave, chaos will ensue. Mm-hmm. And the way that Donald Trump handled this just increased the likelihood of chaos, death, destruction, mm-hmm. and what we're seeing happening in Turkey today. Go ahead, Harry. Yeah, correct. Like th- videos of this will be, will be played to every libertarian presidential candidate for now until, ever. you know, ever, ever, right. ever. ever. Um, it is kind of refreshing to watch uh, people that close to the president to – ignore orders right that is something that everyone's always scared of, like well if they were giving something unconstitutional they'll just follow because they'll just follow orders this is what everyone's you know you, everyone's afraid of someone gets an order they're just going to follow it people questioning it at that top of level kind of gives a little i know it's like this is the this is the silver lining you want I'm like yeah that's about the only little silver line i can get for that little aspect of like wow people are willing to you know disobey orders uh, but the pullout I think it was going to be dirty either way. It's going to be you damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, so he had to pull out. I'm just, yes, could have been done 10, 10 times better. Yeah, could have been worse. Yes, there could be a no worse pull out too. You know, we also got to think about that as well. So it's, you know, you're the idea of trying to appease everyone on this pull out. Yeah, I'm ha- don't get me wrong. I'm happy it, it's, it's pulled out. Could have done it better without having all this cost of life and maybe at least force turkey who's an ally yeah we're gonna pull out but you know can you give them a week can you give them two weeks or do you get some assurances from turkey and also think about the fact that turkey's got 50 new of our 50 of our nuclear weapons sitting there and they were saying just a month ago that they wanted to use those weapons to to regain control of this area so we're handing them that on a platter right we've got we've got russia that's come in which is the other part of this we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and they bombed four hospitals, right? So, I mean, there's all this stuff that's happening because of the way and the method that this was done where no warning was given, no discussions, no, no diplomacy was done to try and mitigate the situation into a, a peaceful transition. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. So let's let's actually dive a little deeper. Now that we've done the overview, let's talk about the Kurds specifically. Uh, who are the Kurds? Uh, so jumping into our show notes, which were so brilliantly written by our contributor, which you can find uh, on the show notes. You can go to weirdlibertarians.com, grab them there, look in the, the description. Um, you can check that out as well. Well, if you find something in there, we timestamp everything. We really, I really try to put a lot of effort now that the, you know, these are like, I mean, the impeachment episode, the past Syrian episode, like these are uh, really complete studies in each one of these issues now. And so we want to make sure that it's easy for you to grab information and share with your friends and they can get to it quicker and past our BS at the beginning too. So, uh, so grab those notes there and share with your friends. I mean, they're frankly, usually around 10 pages of material and sources. So uh, actually go check out our show notes, and that's what we put into each episode. So who are the Kurds? The Kurds are an ethnic group numbering between 25 and 35 million, and they inhabit a mountainous region straddling the borders of Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Armenia. So Armenia is kind of up in the northeast, kind of headed towards the, I think, the Balkans, 
uh, and Russia. And then to the right is Iran, south of them is Iraq, south uh, west is Syria, and then Turkey. And the bulk of their land is in Turkey and northern Iraq, some in Iran. And so think of like the Arabs, all right? So the Arabs are an ethnic group. And so are the Kurds, uh, the Persians in Iran, the Arabians, or not Arabians, I think that's racist now, right? <laughs> uh, I need racism in the <laughs> Kurds area, please. Uh, so the Kurds are mainly Sunni Muslims. They make up the fourth largest ethnic group in the Middle East, but they have never obtained a permanent nation state like the Persians in Iran or the Arabs in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So post-World War I, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, there was an agreement to allow the Kurds to create their own state, then to be known as Kurdistan. This was annotated in the Treaty of Cervez, Sevres in 1920. I don't know how to say that. Three years later, the Treaty of Luson, Luson, La which outlined, listen, no more letting the French decide what we're going to name treaties, all right? <laughs> That's the best part about them losing in World War II is we didn't let them decide treaty names anymore. Um, so three years later, later, the Treaty of Lasana outlined the borders of Turkey, and there was no provision for the Kurdish state. And any and all attempts since then by the Kurds to create their own state has failed, including recently they held votes to try and create a state up in northern Syria because they held so much northern Syrian territory. They're pretty badass fighters. Uh, they, if you, I've watched several Vice, uh, you know. Immersive journalism is awesome, and Vice does a lot of great immersive journalism, and so some of that stuff can be really great to watch. Uh, their clickbait is trash, I fully admit that, but you see like the badass women battalions, like the Kurds train their women first because if you kill a woman, I guess, if you're in battle, then in, if in Islam you don't go to heaven or something crazy in, in the uh, Wahhabist thought, and so the Kurds like train their they have like battalions of women fighters or something crazy. So they're, they're pretty badass women too. Uh, everybody fights in, in uh, the Kurdish. The, 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 it's just like a, a group of people that have had to struggle to survive for a long time, but especially in Turkey, which considers them an enemy, you know, Armenia, look at, think about the Armenian genocide a hundred years ago. The, the Kurds have been through that as well. So the Kurds make up about 15, to 20% of the Turkish population. And so in the 20s, there were some Kurdish uprisings, uh, the same decade that saw the promised Kurdistan plan dashed. And Turkish authorities harshly dealt with these uprisings. Many parts of the Kurdish culture were banned during this time to include their language, festivals, and even their namesake. They were referred to as Mountain Turks instead of Kurds. So fast forward to 1978, to probably the most important part that plays into the current conflict, and that is the creation of the workers, the Kurdistan Workers Party, the PKK, uh, being established with the intent of creating an independent state within Turkey. And within six years' time, the PKK would become an armed struggle, causing the death of 40,000 people and hundreds of thousands of displaced persons. So this struggle is where Turkey really started to view the PKK as a terrorist organization. So it's important to clarify that along the way, the PKK altered their end stated goals in the early 90s, calling instead for greater cultural and political autonomy instead of a, an independent state. Now, a 2013 ceasefire was called after secret talks uh, were had between the PKK and Turkey. The ceasefire lasted all of two years, and ISIS killed 33 activists in the Kurdish town of Sirak near the Syrian border. The PKK accused Turkey of being complicit in the attack and retaliated against the local Turkey soldiers and police. Turkey at this point launched what they called a synchronized war on terror against the PKK and ISIS. Now, Turkey considers YPG, the People's Protection Unit, and the PYD, the Democratic Union Party, to be an extension of the PKK. Therefore, they must, too, be eliminated. So key quote, quote, from, from our research, for us, the PKK and ISIL are the same, said President Erdogan this week, using another term for the Islamic State, ISIL, ISIS, IS, Islamic State. Now, Erdogan is uh, an absolute piece of garbage person. 
uh, who has taken Turkey from a, a state that was nearly admitted into the European Union to an Islamic dictatorship in Turkey. And uh, obviously that's where uh, the, the, the Khashoggi was murdered. He's, he's really just eroded Turkey's presence on the world stage and uh, turned that into a, a hellhole to live in, much like many of the Middle Eastern countries. Um, and that's where Constantinople is, and I refuse to call it Istanbul, Reinhold. I don't know. I just made that up, honestly. <laughs> well, I think someone has a song about that. Uh, may, do they? Do they? Uh, any, anything you guys want to add about that that you may have as you were researching this kind of stuff about the history of the Kurds that might play into this? It's a very obscure question, so the answer can be no. Um, my my take on it is that the problem this is kind of the problem I see a lot of people have is when we start talking about other countries and their conflicts and uh, why there's unrest in certain parts of the world is that we don't realize the long tortuous history that they have, even though we have that in our own country and we all learn about it growing up and all the different things that have happened in the United States. It's like other countries have gone through similar things. I mean, it's not cut and dry as much as people want it to be, especially, um, non-interventionalist is is a lot of t a lot of problems i have with uh, some of the people in the libertarian movement in the non-interventionist movement is that they they try to make it so simple and basic and say you know that we should just do this and this should just be that and this should all work out this way that's not how those societies work it's not how At things all. happen yeah it's yeah it's, you, it's 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 the same sort of simplistic thinking that it was displayed in Sykes Picot and the the drawing of the lines after World War One that created this problem. If we just draw right. lines instead of creating Kurdistan and uh, let's just put three separate ethnic groups into Iraq and it'll be fine. Right. I mean, you know, the it's, it's the same the but opposite type of simplistic thinking. Yeah, the Treaty of Versailles, all the stuff, the treaties that we had after World War One, where we didn't give them what they needed and what they wanted, we we started drawing lines as. Um, Europeans and Western and United States deciding, oh, this is the way it should be. We'll make it look this way. And these people can live here and these people live here and drew the lines more on what was best for us, not what was best for them. Uh, and letting them have really a say in that, I think was the biggest mistake we've made in a long time. And it really led to uh, a lot of the problems we're seeing right now. Yeah, and these lines are some of the, the major conflicts that have been going on in the world for a while. Uh, just in the Middle East themselves, these artificial lines that were created, and just and that's half the reason a lot of issues after uh, post-colonial rule in Africa, they're having such issues because a lot of these lines were not drawn on correct uh not where the uh, the tribes are, just more like, nope, this is the territory that the French control. This is the line that we draw. This fits our comfortable map. We do not care that your neighbor over there, that you guys have been sharing this line for uh, for centuries. Don't give a hell. Don't give a damn. This is a line now. Flat line. Deal with it. And then like, oh, no, now we're shocked. That there's conflicts over these lines that we draw. This is crazy. Yeah. So – if you look at the map in the show notes of where the Kurds are at, they're just kind of all over the place. They're just um, definitely, uh, sorry, I uh, got distracted by Harry's beautiful voice. Uh, I was. Uh, it happens, baby. Uh, anyways, uh, you look at the map, the, the Kurds are just kind of all over the place, including in Iraq. And this is where I think most people probably heard the Kurds for the first time. They were instrumental in the lead up to the Iraq war. Well, the, the, he gassed the Kurds, he gassed the Kurds, meaning Saddam Hussein. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the Kurds in Iraq. Uh, just like in Turkey, the Kurds began to fight for autonomy in northern Iraq in the 60s via armed conflict. Um, this, they really are some of the most badass fighters on the planet. Uh, one of the retaliatory measures by the Iraqi government later in the mid-70s was to reallocate Arabs into Kurdish areas, forcing Kurds to relocate. This relocation was accelerated in the 1980s during the Iran-Iraq War. And one of the lower points for the Kurds in Iraq was in 1988 when Saddam Hussein unleashed a massive campaign against the Kurds that included a chemical attack on Halabaja. Why can't they name their countries after the white tongue? Hmm? 
<laughs> Sorry, was that colonial of me? I apologize. Colonizer. Americanize I'm all these places. I'm embarrassed on this podcast in front of 12,000 people. Change the name of your culture. Yeah, um, let's put some names that you know look good on the back of jerseys. Right, like he hate me. Uh, so <laughs> that's obscure. So fast forward to 91 and the Iraq is on the losing end of the Gulf War due to the 100-hour ground war that routed Iraqi forces. And that prompts the Kurds to raise another rebellion in hopes of attaining autonomy. It's a, it was uh, suppressed violently. A key thing to note here is that President Bush at the time urged the Shiite and Kurdish insurgents to rise up against Saddam only to leave them hanging post-1991 to fend for themselves against Saddam Hussein. There was actually a quote by uh, Henry Kissinger, and I'm, I, I don't have this in front of me, but he basically said, uh, promise the Kurds anything you want. They'll believe any joke you tell them, which was pretty crazy to hear from uh, Henry Kissinger, but there's a long history of the Kurds not being able to trust any allies, but especially America. Now, President Bush Sr.'s betrayal of the Kurds led to thousands of deaths, and the only assistance the U.S. gave was the emplacement of a, quote, no-fly zone, if you remember those, in northern Iraq to allow the Kurds to gain some semblance of a semi autonomous region. So President Bush uh, I says, uh, to occupy Iraq would shatter our coalition, turning the whole Arab world against us and make a broken tyrant into a latter-day Arab hero. Bush later said, it would have taken us way beyond the imprateur of international law, assigning young soldiers to a fruitless hunt for a securely entrenched dictator and condemning them to fight in what would be an unwinnable urban guerrilla war. Would anyone like to point out the irony of Senior's quote? Go ahead, Harry. Um, all right, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, I'm just, just wanting to, just want to know, is he a psychic? Or uh, right iconic, or <laughs> or did he have something that we just don't see a lot these days and that's good understanding of foreign policy right well when you've been in the cia and you helped kill kennedy yeah. you know well yeah you developed most of the allegedly most of the foreign uh policy over the past 30 years you know right kind of know it a little bit so uh, one side note, the Gulf War enabled the long-term presence of U.S. bases in the Middle East in places like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. The, president, the presence of U.S. troops near Muslim holy sites is cited by Osama bin Laden as one of America's biggest transgressions against Islam. And that was uh, that they were coming fresh off of their victory against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And uh, Osama bin Laden went to the king of Saudi Arabia and said, if you let the Americans build bases here, they will never leave. We still have three bases there. He said, don't let the Americans come in and fight Saddam Hussein and drive them out of Kuwait. Let the Mujahideen do it. And the king of Saudi Arabia said, no, we're going to let our oil partners do it. And uh, that was a major reason why Osama bin Laden uh, started to terrorize the United States. So fun fact. So in 2003, the Kurds assisted the U.S. in toppling Saddam Hussein and created a regional government in three provinces. Now, in 2017, the Kurdistan region in Iraq held a referendum on independence. The vote was opposed by the Iraqi government, and shortly thereafter, pro-Iraqi government forces took control of the region. So now let's take a look at the Kurds and ISIS. So the first conflict the Kurds had with ISIS was in the mid-2013s as ISIS began to attack three Kurdish enclaves that bordered ISIS territory in northern Syria. Now, ISIS was finally repelled in mid-2014 by the Syrian Kurdish Union Party's armed force, the People's Protection Units, the YPGs. Yeah, you know me's. Around the same time ISIS was repelled in Syria, mid-2014, ISIS began to advance into northern Iraq, and this caused Iraq's autonomous Kurdistan region to employ the Peshmerga forces, basically a Kurdish military force in northern Iraq, to... Uh, areas that were abandoned by the Iraqi army. So once the Iraqi army could no longer fight ISIS, the Kurds, the Peshmerga did. Now, a surprise offense by the jihadists led to the Peshmerga having to withdraw and relinquish security control over numerous towns. That was the trigger for the U.S. to lead a multinational coalition uh, airstrikes in northern Iraq back in 2014. 
Now, military advisors were also sent to the Peshmerga, the YPG mentioned earlier, and the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, also came to the aid of the Peshmerga. Now, a reminder, the PKK is the Kurdish party fighting for Kurdish autonomy in Turkey for the past three decades. So the Turkish Kurds came down and helped the Iraqi Kurds, which is part of what uh, Erdogan is so pissed off about, who is the president of Turkey. Um, so he basically screams, they all look alike. They're all the same people. They're all, they're all in it together. So... Yeah. Go ahead. And they, also, they also paranoid. They also paranoid nature of the aspect of if uh, these what and if they because he's probably thinking like they're all talk to each other, moving things around. What if these ones that are working with the Americans are getting stuff and they're eventually going to challenge my power once I piss everybody off here in Turkey? But, right. Anyway. Yeah. You know, they they only they only send their you know their rapists and the murderers and stuff too. Right. <laughs> That's a good one. All right. Uh, so, uh, so in effect, we have Kurdish ground forces fighting um, ISIS in northern Iraq with the support of the U.S.-led multinational coalition of airstrikes. The Kurds identify ISIL fighters, and the coalition employed the airstrike. So we, we had them finding out where the bunkers were, and we were the ones droning them. So an important thing to note here is that with regard to Syria, Turkey never sought to attack the Islamic State despite the ex extreme close proximity to its borders. Turkey, more than anything, impeded the ability of Turkish Kurds to move across the border to defend their Iraqi counterparts. The only time Turkey deems it necessary to attack ISIS in Syria is in the town of Jarablus. Jarablus. Uh, the taking of this key border town was really only so the YPG-led SDF would be unable to seize the key terrain that would have enabled them to link up with Kurdish enclave uh, of Afrin to the west. I'm addicted to Afrin. Uh, the Kurds, <laughs> if you're watching the YouTube, I snorted some a little bit ago. Uh, the Kurds, with the backing of the U.S. military, its allies, and a handful of other Arab militias, steadily throw ISIS out of the northern Syria and establish control over a large stretch of terrain along the Turkey border. And the Kurdish fight against ISIS culminated in March 2019 when the last pocket of the caliphate lost its final piece of territory in the village of Baguz. So in March 2019, ISIS was defeated, and shit, Donald Trump was telling the truth. Uh, but the Kurdish were the ones who actually did it, not Donald Trump. So the Kurds hailed this as the total elimination of the caliphate, but were also quick to warn that a jihadist sleeper cell remains a, quote, great threat to the world. Now, it's, it, it's important to note the SDF was left to deal with the thousands of suspected ISIS militants captured between 27 and 19, uh, 2019. So the Kurds were the ones uh, guarding a lot of these suspected ISIS terrorists and jailed them. That'll come into play in the last couple weeks soon. So also important to note there are displaced women and children associated with the captured militants. Um, and the U.S. called for reparation of foreign nationals among them, a repatriation, excuse me. So if you find a foreign national, then you send them back home. But most of their home countries refused to take any ISIS back. Now, Turkey saw the terrain formerly controlled by ISIS uh, is now in the hands of the Kurds under the banner of the SDF. This prompted Turkey to now want to create a deep, quote, safe zone, a 20-mile wide portion of northeastern Syria to protect its borders. So that kind of, uh, so that few other points and then we'll kind of break all that down a little bit more. Turkey absolutely does not want the Kurds to retain any land because this may become Kurdistan and the Kurds have been wanting to create that for decades. They don't want to create a country on their border that is hostile to Turkey. And the desired safe zone is also where Turkey plans on in placing the Syrian refugees that found their way into Turkey. The Russian-backed Syrian government has also continued to promise that it will retake control over all of Syria. So uh, it starts to get worse once we get to what just happened. So it's important to understand the dy dynamic between Turkey and the Kurds and what's happening. Turkey wants to create a buffer zone in Kurdish-controlled Syria of 20 miles deep. And in that 20-mile zone, they wanted to put the I think it was a million or two million Syrian refugees that were in Turkey that are causing problems. 
uh, these refugees, just as you may have seen on your Count Dankula videos on YouTube uh, about Sweden, they're causing problems in Turkey and in uh, Russia and other countries. And so uh, these countries are all eager to send Syrian refugees back to their home country. And they want to do that in the buffer zone. And uh, they want basically a space of Syrian Arabs between them and the Kurds. And they don't want the Kurds to have any gained territory. So they're eager to make sure that none of that happens. Now, that 20-mile zone is breaking down into almost non-existence now. Um, but that's where we were before the president pulled us out. Uh, do either of you anything else that you'd like to add beyond the notes there? All right. I think Reinhold's, Reinhold has to have something to say. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think you covered it pretty well. I don't, I don't think there's really anything more to add to that point other than there are other things going on behind the scenes too with Syria and, and Russia and their desires to get some access into into the land region uh, control um, pipeline issues because um, Western Europe and the United States have been trying to isolate Russia and keep um, them from being able to sell um, natural gas to to Europe and they're trying to find alternate methods to do that uh, so that they can kind of punish Russia. So now Russia's trying to find alternate ways to get their oil and their uh, gas up into the, the region. And, and yeah. this is one of the ways to doing that is, is trying to kind of enforce their influence into this region, which we kind of just handed to them yeah. uh, recently. So energy is really all that matters about this entire area pipelines mm -hmm. and oil and natural gas and uh, it's not, not and not the sand towns <laughs> that exist um so <clears throat> that leads us up to october 6th when president trump gave his endorsement for a turkish military operation that would sweep across kurdish forces near the syrian border now as we stated earlier Turkey views the Kurdish fighters on the, under the Syrian Democratic Force the SDF along the border to be a terrorist organization. Uh, the daily podcast that we played earlier from the New York Times actually had an interview with the most powerful general for, by the Kurds um, which was pretty interesting to listen to as well. I'll throw that into the show notes for you. Um, so they the Kurds are view this SDF is viewed by the Turks as a terrorist organization. And while they are viewed as a terrorist organization to Turkey due to their history discussed earlier, the Kurds in Syria operating under the SDF have been the United States most reliable ally in fighting the Islamic State in the northern region of Syria. So in all of this mess, we're obviously anti-Assad. We're anti-Iran, just to the right. We're pro-Iraq, sort of. We're sort of pro-Turkey. And we're definitely anti-ISIS as a nation in terms of our foreign policy. The only group that doesn't like any of those people are the Kurds. And that is why we have long partnered with them, only to let them down. So Repeatedly. Repeatedly. And they have been in the, in the war against Saddam, in the wars against Saddam, in the war for Iraq and Iraq II, in the war against ISIS. The Kurds have been our most reliable ally. Uh, now, on Sunday, after a brief discussion with Turkey's president, President Erdogan, it looks like Erdogan uh, to the Hoosier eye, uh, President Trump, through his officials, announced that the 100 to 150 military uh, personnel in Syria would be pulled back prior to any Turkish military operations against the Kurds. Now, remember, early in the show, we said that this is not a very big force of soldiers, right? What good does 100 to 150 soldiers do? Well, they're there to train the, the people who are actually doing the fighting. They're there to share intelligence. They're there to call in airstrikes. They're there to share intelligence with the Kurds on the ground. But mainly their goal is to be human bodyguards. What, what was the, um, in the Iraq war, the concern? Human shields. Human shields, yes. They're basically human shields because... <laughs> having American personnel, Americans, and, and I think just any national 
nationalistic nation kind of has this screwed up view that human dignity is bestowed upon people who live under a certain flag and all others can go straight to hell because they're not really people. Uh, and so if you kill one of ours, we're going to kill 200 of yours. Uh, so pulled back is kind of a relative term. So this is sort of where, you know, the, the dispute between Amash and, you know, we're not, and Rand Paul is, we're not really leaving. So let's kind of dig into that a little bit. So pulled back is a relative term as the personnel are not leaving Syria. They're just leaving the northern portion currently under Kurdish control. So when Donald Trump said on Twitter that he was pulling troops, the, the troops out of Syria, what you and Joe Average Public reads is, oh, cool, Americans are leaving Syria. This is a common tactic. Mm -hmm. If you believe any president of the United States, I'm sorry, I've got a bridge in Arizona that I'd like to sell you or whatever that phrase is. When a president tells you that we have ceased military operations or the fighting in Iraq is over or and then we've just built the biggest embassy in the world or we're leaving, we're ending military operations in Afghanistan, but leaving hundreds of thousands of troops around in the area or we're pulling out of Syria, meaning we're just moving them to the southern part of the country there. You're being lied to. I just named Bush, Obama, Trump couldn't be three different presidents on the planet if you tried. And they all lied to you. Donald Trump was lying to the American people on Twitter saying that he was pulling us out of Syria. He was not. He was moving from the north to the south. So he absolutely lied about it. It was not some great non-interventionist victory. It was just another lie from Donald Trump. 3D chess. Well, can't wait till we move back to the non-liar Bill Clinton from the 90s. <laughs> right. Back when president didn't lie to us but what about ism doesn't play here the fact is is that just because we as libertarians like that he lied we like the lie it doesn't mean that it makes it acceptable that he lied to our faces he was not telling the truth and that particular day october 6th just go look at his tweets from that day and tell me that mike Insane. pence would... <laughs> here's the thing i have been very i have worked very hard many of you in 2015 and 2016 said you didn't like the way that I talked about Donald Trump. I heard you and I do agree and have reformed my ways because when you talk negatively about Donald Trump or AOC or whomever, people take that personally. They hear you criticizing them and not their favorite cult icon. A lot of you Ron Paul people are the same exact way, uh, by the way. Uh, so I try very hard not to be too critical or take cheap jabs at people like Donald Trump doesn't mean that I like Donald Trump. I do think that Donald Trump does not always get the fair benefit of the doubt. The news media is definitely an activist group at this point against him, which I find to be grotesque. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that Donald Trump isn't a complete lunatic lying piece of shit. <laughs> right? And I think that just because we agree on a couple things, like his general sentiment about non-interventionism, it doesn't mean that we need to take him seriously because he's not a serious person. Well, and remember, too, the, the motivations for these things are important. Why does he want to be non-interventionist? Right. Because it looks better in the polls for him. Yes. That's the only reason. Not because he cares about these people or he thinks that non-interventionism is a great idea. It's what gets him elected, keeps him popular. That's if what Donald being a populist Trump, is. Right. If Donald Trump were actually interested in being a non-interventionist, he would appoint as his secretary of defense and his secretary of state, someone that Rand Paul or Ron Paul recommended to right. him. <laughs> right. Right. He, if, if Donald Trump were serious about the things that libertarians cared about, he would put libertarian people in those places, but he does not do that. The people that Donald Trump appoints to positions are people like Mike Pompeo, who has been a, a hawk in Congress for a very long time and is leading a hawkish foreign policy. It is, it is people like James Mattis, who was fairly, um, he was better than a lot of his predecessors like Donald Rumsfeld, but James Mattis resigned because he wanted to pull troops out of Syria. So don't tell me that Donald Trump is the great non-interventionist hope when Donald Trump's actions do not match his words and his words do not match reality. There has to come a point in time, and I am quickly approaching it, where Having been a Hoosier my entire life and understanding that Mike Pence was the worst governor in Indiana modern history by a mile, 
that Mike Pence might even be a better president than this doofus. Like, go and look at his Twitter on October 6th and tell me that this is a person who is completely in command of not just his job, but also his faculties. Like, I'm his, getting to that point. His sense of reality, I think, has, has part great, of it too, yeah. I think the stress has eroded his I, th- I think the Donald Trump of today, we are just boiled in, in the soup like the frog. I think it's very hard to go back and look at the Donald Trump of 2017 when he was doing a lot of things where I was like, okay, the Trump derangement syndrome isn't real. And so now, but now we're getting to a place where like this Kurdish thing, once we get through this, it's unhinged. It's insane. Like there's no thought put into this. It's reckless. Mm-hmm. It, it, it may be in the right direction of the policy that I want, but there's nothing about this that is supportive of peace. And well, I have to be honest with a lot of. Uh, go ahead, then I'll be. I'll, say it. It's yeah. always been this way with Donald Trump, though. If you go back and because I used to be a big fan of watching uh, The Apprentice because I was in business and I was always interested to see kind of how business people thought and did things, and it became very clear early on that he is just winging it. Yeah. all the time he doesn't really think things through and he just goes with his gut and which is fine once in a while but you got to have some foundation for that and he just doesn't seem to have it and then you hear the stories later on about the producers would have to uh, go back and re-edit the show to make it look like his decisions made sense they right. were messing with reality in order to make him look smarter than he really was and it was just that sort of thing going on it, i don't think this is something new i think that for the first part of his administration he had people in there who were saying hey look you know we need to stop this they were they were pushing back towards him uh they were more concerned about the office and then he slowly either pushed them out by making them want to quit or firing them and then re and putting in people who are much more loyal to him and much more whatever you say will do. You know, he's getting more and more of those people in there and now he's feeling more emboldened about it. And he's just doing more stuff that really, frankly, he needs to, he needs somebody to tell him to to stop and think about some things. Right. And that's like the weird thing about whole Trump because didn't vote for Trump. Don't like, uh, and I, when I argue with people, it's more of a, I'm not defending him. I'm just saying, like, can we legitimately criticize this guy? Because he's done a lot wrong, and we can criticize that. We can talk about that all day, all day. And this is like, and this is good. Be, this is one of them. We can talk bad about this, but the other stuff, it's like, come on. That's no, that's, that's the crazy part is that we're right. in a nation that it, it, is ready to impeach the, the political establishment, is ready to impeach him over a bad phone call. Right. And, and it's, it's, then you look at this situation. Yeah, I know, but you look at this situation, and this is so much more egregious, and it's costing human lives. Mm-hmm. And that wouldn't get him impeached. It's not even on the table that this would get him impeached. But well, I don't know about that. I think this does get it. I think this can get him impeached because this is going to cause all the Republican senators who are saying, "There's no way I'm voting his for his removal," to go, "Wait a minute." This was, I think this, maybe I'm going to start looking at voting for his removal, and that could this, get him removed. Yeah, I think he's going to be uh, impeached. I I don't think there's any doubt that the numbers are there. He's going to be impeached. The question is what happens in the Senate. And this move, I think, at the wrong time, and it's it's uncanny to me. It's almost like he's purposely trying to get kicked out of office. You 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 are uh, you your bias probably because you're a communist. (laughs) probably makes them more hopeful these rats will go I'm, right back to no no no. Right i'm not saying i'm not saying it's going to happen i'm just saying it, it becomes a, a discussion point but it, it, it gets put on the table right mm-hmm. so yeah like i said i think that, i think impeachment's going to happen i don't know if he's going to get removed i don't he, he probably won't he'll find some way to squeam out of it everything else but, gets impeached gets re gets reelected well i don't think he gets reelected I, I really i don't i've said i've said for for a year i don't see the path for that but because his and I've been I've been listening to other people talk about this too. It's his base is solid, but mm-hmm. there's no room for growth. Anybody who's not all in on Trump right now is not going to be a supporter of Trump. So he's getting 35 to 40 percent easy, you know, 42, 43 percent that he gets approval on. Nobody else is going to support him and go for him. Right. How do you win right. with that? And, I, I, right. and I think Rhino is absolutely right on this, and it's the Democrats' par- race to lose. Right. Mm-hmm. And they're showcasing yeah. that. The yeah. only person, the only way I think they could lose, the only way I think they could lose is if they put Hillary back in there because she's the only person he can beat. 
No, you're insane. No. <laughs> There's you're, no you're way. Come absolutely on. batshit insane if you think that only Hillary can lose. Beto can lose. Bernie can well, there's lose. No, Beto's, lose. There's no oh, way yeah, that anybody like that's going to be allowed to be a candidate <sighs> for the DNC. You like know the, that. Yeah. Beto's, there's, he's just a joke to the, to the party. Elizabeth Warren is so weak and vulnerable, and she will likely be the nominee. And it, it's very realistic that it could be, if Justin Amash runs, it, it could be him at 15%, because these two uh, are going I, to be another, it will be a referendum. No, it's not going to be that. What it's going to be is it's going to be, nobody's going to care about the person. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the... It'll be about the fear. All these states put in the, into place uh, all these anti-abortion laws, which mm-hmm. scared the crap out of all the Democrats and all the, all the middle-of-the-road people who are now seeing what kind of what kind of policies they're trying to put in place because they think they have it in on the Supreme Court. They're not going to let Trump have a chance to replace RBG. I mean, they're going to come out in force. There's nobody staying home this time. In 2016, people stayed home as they thought Hillary had it in the bag. Yeah, no no way. I I agree with you in that fear is the only motivator for this election. And when you've got got fear, you got just like you did with 2016, the Libertarian Party candidate is not going to get a blip. I mean, look at all the support that that Gary Johnson had at a point. Normally got. Hmm? Johnson got three times what he normally no, no, no. got. He, got he, he did. Times the media. He did because I think he had that. He had a good campaign and a good thing, but look how his support eroded near the end because everybody saw how close the race was kind of getting. That's that they were like, I couldn't, I can't, I can't take the chance this time. It's going to be worse in 2020. Mm-hmm. It, it, oh, here's the thing. I think that this last six months for Trump, if an Amash runs, for instance, the National Review crowd, the Jonah Goldbergs of the world, the the people, the Matt Lewises of the world who are soft, if not now hostile to Trump. Like I've watched Matt Lewis, who is a podcaster that I enjoy. I think I support him on Patreon. Um, he, he seems fair minded uh, and he used to work for the Daily Caller. I don't know where he writes now, but uh, I've seen Matt Lewis go full never Trumper in the last week. I think the thing with Trump is that he has that stick because but, but Rob Kendall the, did the same thing too. Yeah, Rob Kendall's <laughs> it's RK now. Okay, it's RK now. No, the thing with the thing with Rob Kendall's a cult member. He's part yeah. of the Trump cult. Yeah, Those but he had his never, moment where he was on, like, "Let me finish." Him. Can I finish? The, right, Kendall is a cult member. He's a true believer. He loves Trump. He's he's daddy. There's always going to be those people, and that you're right. That is thirty to forty percent of the base, and but I think you're going to start to really see people like me, for instance, who will who have been willing to give Trump the benefit of the doubt because he is, in my opinion, unfairly treated by the press. I will go. What did he really say? What really happened? What was really intended? Like because I just don't jump at the first narrative and go. <gasps> Like I well, just like the coming, thing, but the, the the thing with Trump in the last six months, starting with the kids at the border, and then this, and just like his general erratic nature has increased. He's he's devolving. Like I just think you're you're starting to get people like me who are more center right going. Any benefit of the doubt that he had, he's just he can't, he can't do the job. Like he's lying to my face about the most important issue to me, and that's the thing. Every single issue that is important, he lies about, and so it only takes it only takes one person going. And I, I want to be clear: I was never going to vote for Donald Trump, and I wasn't going to support him. I'm saying I didn't have Trump derangement syndrome. I wasn't hyperventilating like Dennis every time Donald Trump farted. I defended him for two years on right. on. Uh, the collusion thing. I still was right about that. Yeah. But no. I mean, if, he, right if he had, if he had just let the the investigation go through, and not been such a a whiny blank about it, um, then he would have gone through the whole thing, been exonerated as as having not done anything. You know, the thing he is he was accused of doing during the Russia Gate thing is what he did with Ukraine and China. I mean, right. he just said, okay, I'm just going to do that. What I, The one thing that I was told that I was safe from, I'm just going to do that. But if he had just kept his mouth shut and, and let that go through and come out and the reporting come out, it would have been no problem. But he committed so many 
acts of of attempted destruction of justice during that because he just couldn't let it go his mind it was it was just like nixonian almost in the enemies list and things like that and you talk about the media being unfair to him the media is not just the left media right it's not just cnn and abc and cbs but you've got fox and you've got national review and you've got all these other people who are carrying his water to the point where they're lying about what he's saying and doing in a way to, to give him that bonus so it's 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 polar that's the real problem it's not just that the media is unfair to him it's that the media just doesn't know how to deal with it and don't know how to report it properly on both sides so yeah, you can't I, get a good a good middle of the road examination of what's happening anymore yeah i think there's defense fatigue too it's just mm-hmm. like I looked at this Syrian situation. And I just went, I just don't have the desire to defend him on this. Like I get that there's a non-interventionist impulse here, but he did it the wrong way. And he, he made our, he made us look bad. And for, Harry's so right for the rest of our lives. Mm-hmm. Anytime any non-interventionism is brought up, it will be, yeah, but Syria, mm-hmm. you know, it'll be like James Weeks and Aleppo and how we never fucking hear the end of those two things. Like, Honestly, it's like four years after the James Weeks thing. If you bring that up, you're an absolute moron. You are just – the person who brings up James Weeks dancing on stage loses 50 IQ points with me. I just generally think you're, you're, you're toilet water. Like I just think you have the intelligence of toilet water. That's not true. I had, uh, I had alphabet uh, – what's the alphabet cereal for breakfast? I, I crapped a better sentence than that. Yes, alphabets. Uh, so let's jump back into uh, Turkey, and unless you have something you want to add, Harry. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's pretty fine. So now he, Donald Trump pulled back forces, meaning the personnel are not actually leaving Syria. Uh, they're just leaving Kurdish-controlled areas. And this is seen as an obvious betrayal. Turkey, as predicted, is now actively attacking the Kurds in northern Syria with the goal of exterminating all Kurds they view as terrorists. Interesting enough is that the U.S.-backed Kurdish forces near northern Syria have actually begun to display, began to displace away from the Turkish border beginning this past August. So this was done basically to appease the Turkish government. So the U.S. and the Kurds were basically moving away from Turkey to calm Turkey down. However, the pace of the retrograde was not fast enough. You can tell them a soldier wrote these because the pace of the retrograde, that's such a military way to say that, was not fast enough for President Erdogan's liking. Therefore, he planned to launch an incursion across the border. Um, While many view the U.S. stance as one of just staying out of the way between the Kurds and the Turks, there is reason to believe the U.S. may have assisted Turkey in their advance against the Kurds by sharing intelligence with Turkey as part of the counterterrorism partnership that they hold. Another component to this story is interesting in, in the fact that the president appears to be operating against the advice of his military personnel, diplomats, and advisors. At the most recent UN General Assembly summit in late September, American officials, including Trump, we're in a consensus on ensuring the welfare of the Kurdish forces and warding off Turkey's persistent desire to attack those forces. Um, president Erdogan and his officials perceived a sharp division between the president and the rest of his team, most notably his generals in central command. Now central command or CENTCOM is the geographic combatant command that oversees all military operations in the middle East. The whole world is divided up by geographic combatant commands The one involved here just happens to be CENTCOM due to its location. So so even our allies or opponents or whatever, that's the the crazy part about the Syrian conflict, is that America can't seem to figure out who it, it supports and who its allies are and who its enemies are. It's like, is Erdogan our enemy? Is it, are they our ally? Are we sharing information with them or not? Are we against the Kurds or for the Kurds? Like, this has been a recurring theme in this particular conflict. Despite Turkey buying Russian S-400 missile defense systems, President Trump appears to favor President Erdogan. Don't they all get along? Uh, One component that is flying under the radar is the fact that even though President Trump announced the total defeat of the Islamic State, this isn't true. Yes, the caliphate has lost its territory, but the terrorist group still is present and regrouping now. Uh, So we have two major issues here. 
the start of a possible Kurdish massacre at the hands of the Turks, and two, the fact that the Islamic State is a relevant threat that is not entirely defeated. Another major issue to add is the fact that the Kurds in northern Syria, with the backing and support of the U.S., has been thousands of Islamic prisoners, Islamic State prisoners. The Kurds are not able to both survive the ongoing Turkish attacks and maintain security over their prisoners. Prisoners are already escaping their captors during Turkish airstrikes on PKK forces. The Turks have claimed that they will take uh, control of guarding ISIS prisoners, but that is a fantasy. They won't do it, uh, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, Brett McGurk, a former American diplomat and special presidential envoy for the Global Coalition to uh, counter ISIL, says, This sudden and unnecessary betrayal of the SDF strengthens the hands of our adversaries and competitors throughout the region and the world. The saying, quote, never get into a well with an American rope is gaining currency. The impact will be long lasting. Um, so that is one. Uh, I saw one uh, very pro-Israel religious podcast this week. Uh, one episode was titled, Can the Israelis Trust the Americans? Um, I think it's fairly, um, it should be basically understood at this point, after Obama and Trump's foreign policies, that uh, the Americans can't seem to figure out if they want to be interventionist or non-interventionist. They want to be non-interventionists, but they don't want to actually be non interventionist They want to sell the weapons, but they don't want to send their military, but then they want to send the military, and then they want to move them here. Like, there's absolutely zero clarity. Any ally will be betrayed. There's no consistency. It's just getting to a point where the American empire is very obviously collapsing around the world. I know that makes some people um, a little bit nervous, when we call America an empire, but we have bases in how many countries around the world? Isn't it like there's 100 and, 196 countries in yeah. the world and we're in 193? Um, we have bases on 175-ish, I believe. Uh, so we are an empire. The whole point of keeping 100 American troops in this particular region was so that we could, as Ben Shapiro put it, an ounce of prevention prevents uh, an active hot war with Iran. Uh, Iran, 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 Iran. We're all worried about Iran. Iran, let's be honest. Um, are, are, are the Iranians Sunni or Shia? I, I believe they're Sunni. It's, it's the Sunni Wahhabists that are the ones that have attacked Americans and not the Shias, right? Like, I may have that backwards. I always get that totally. I think it's backwards. I think the Shiites are the, yeah, they're the ones who have been attacking us so. you'll, you'll have to go back to listen to our iran and our syrian episodes to, to hear more detailed information on that but th the fact is is that anyone connected to iran has never attacked the united states in our interests they've attacked right. israel hezbollah has definitely attacked israel but that is not a client state of the united states maybe it is but uh, <laughs> 51st state <laughs> for another show uh but iran yeah, but, is more shia than sunni okay all right that's right and uh, Saudi Arabia Sunni. And the reason, remember the reason why Iran is that way is because our foreign policy mm -hmm. um, let that happen. Just it's another example of how we get involved and we make things worse uh, by not knowing what we're doing and not, take, not looking out for what's best for the area, but more what's best for us. Right. So we, we're in a position where everybody's concerned about Iran, but let's be honest, Iran... Oh. Iran seems to want what most of these countries want. They want to control their region, and they want us to get the hell out of their way exactly. and let them do it. Let all these – I mean, it's, it's misery for the people. But Iran, the, Iran's the not day, dumb they, enough. I mean, it's just like North Korea. I, I know that North Korea and the guy's crazy and wants to have – but he just wants control and wants people right. to leave him alone, just like Iran does. They know that the minute they do something – that's over the line we're just going to carpet bomb them and turn them into glass right i mean there's no they know there's no way to win that situation so they're just trying to edge out what they can to make to to make their control better and and solidify their power in their region right and so this so so let's jump back to isis terrorists uh, being released from Kurdish prisons and create conditions being created by the Turks to allow that to happen. Why is that? 
It's because the Turks want ISIS to exist. Assad wants ISIS to, ISIS to exist. Russia and Iran want ISIS to exist. The United States of America wants ISIS to exist and to, in some ways, flourish and prosper. You we want an enemy that you can, can, you can beat. It's not too powerful that you can't just kind of put down want, when you need to. You but want the an boogeyman that's always there. Right. You want an excuse. The reason that we were so excited, Donald Trump, when he first got to office, was so excited that he sold weapons to Saudi Arabia. It wasn't that he sold new weapons. It's that he sold 40 years of parts to the Saudi Arabians. It's the parts that are really important. It, it, it all leads back to what we talked about in that last episode on the JFK stuff. It is about a, an endless war that is ever persistent that feeds the military industrial complex and continues. And you're exactly right. ISIS is a perfect enemy for the establishment that is funded by defense contractors. There is no major think tank in Washington, D.C. that holds a non-interventionist foreign policy. They're all interventionist, and they all, like the Council on Foreign Relations and the Brookings Institution, trace their roots back to Wilsonian foreign policy and the early 1900s and Woodrow Wilson's friends, the Wilson Center, the Atlantic Council. The, they all formed around the idea of getting America into foreign entanglements so they could be a grand player on the, on the stage. And then after World War II, the defense contractors saw uh, wisdom in advertising in Washington media, funding think tanks, and insuring. That's why it's so dangerous that George Soros and the Koch brothers combined forces to start a non-interventionist think tank that is now being spun up. It's the only one. And ISIS is the perfect foil for the United States. It's those scary Muslim terrorists who, if we don't fight them over there, we're going to have to fight them here. And uh, they commit horrible atrocities with, and make slick videos of them. And uh, it, it is the pretext that every major power and regional power has for maintaining an endless civil war in a country that has been completely devastated. They'll send the poor back from their countries, like in Turkey, and send them right back to Syria and re-abuse them. And not one of the people in power gives a single solitary fuck about the poor person that lives in Syria. None of them care, including in Washington, D.C., including Donald Trump. They don't care. They're not Americans who gives a shit. So what you have to understand is that the Kurds are really the only people that have been invested in truly fighting and defeating ISIS, maintaining the jails, and keeping them invested. But I will say, We've got to be engaged in the forever war to keep ISIS. We've got to stay and support the Kurds because ISIS will escape if we don't. It's just another long list of why we ought to. And the, the Middle East, there's always another reason why we have to stay engaged in the Middle East. It's why we have to continually be, if, if we leave, then this will happen. If we leave, then the Taliban will take over Afghanistan. There's just a never-ending parade of excuses for us to stay engaged in the Middle East. You know, in 2001, it was they did 9-11. In 2003, it was Saddam had WMDs. In 2007, it was the Iraqi Civil War. In 2009, it was that we'd almost won. You know, in 2011, it's, it's we can't pull out. 2013, it was they're too unstable. 2015, it was ISIS. 2017, it was Assad. 2019, it's the Kurds. It's just a never-ending cycle of reasons why we need to stay engaged in the Middle East. And I am fatigued with it, and I'm sorry. We have continually perpetuated the problem by maintaining our presence there. So I do support us leaving Syria completely. I do not support us staying there forever, but I also want us to do it in an orderly way that protects peace and protects human lives in the best possible way. Uh, and I don't believe, I, I, I think that kind of gets lost and that even gets lost in the libertarian movement. I was listening to one prominent foreign policy leaders podcast today and their guest basically said something to the effect of, you know, I, I, I actually am okay with that Russian intervention in Syria because it prevented a Christian Holocaust. 
And the host kind of tacitly agreed. And I'm like, you're always against the American intervention for, for, for to prevent genocide, but the Russian intervention was okay. Our goal should be peace. It should not be anti-Americanism, <laughs> which sometimes we slip well, into. And like I was saying before, it's, it's the way you do it. I mean, it sounds like we had a path to peace in the area where we were slowly backing out of the disputed zone. The Kurds were slowly backing out of, this, of the zone. The, the Turkey was saying it wasn't fast enough. And then Trump just said, ah, oh, the heck with it, we're leaving. Right. right. And if we had done something there, we could have, we could have extricated ourselves in a way that was equitable and safe for people. Right now we've got, I mean, I was looking at a, a listing of, of what's happened just in the couple of days since this uh, took place is we've got 785 people affiliated with ISIS have escaped. 100,000 people have been displaced, 81 Kurdish fighters and 60 civilians have been killed. Right. Um, we've got, uh, approximately 50 nuclear weapons the U.S. has stored in the area are now effectively hostages. So even if we do try to sanction them and go back in and stop what's going on, they're like, well, we've got all these you know, weapons over here. What do you want to do about that? You know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy because it's, it's not a situation that's really limited to Trump. I think he's, he's uh, famously bad at this, but I see this a lot in, in libertarian circles where we say, this is what society should look like. And this is what our non-intervention should look like. And this is what our government should look like. And we go out and say that that's what our end goal is, which is great because we should do that. But then not having a plan to get us there in a way that makes sense. And people don't want to, don't want, I mean, they may say, hey, that sounds great, but how are we going to get there? We don't want chaos. We don't, we need to be able to wake up the next day and have our jobs and be able to buy food and not have what happened in Venezuela. Right. So we want to have, some sort of stability while we're going through this process. And then you have the returning candidates running for office saying the day I get into office as a president, I'm shutting everything off that day. And the next day, everything will be done. And it's like, you, nobody's going to do that because that's insane. You have to think about what you're doing and what the ramifications are, not just what you wish them to be or what you think, you know, I, you can't dream this into being. You know, we've got lots of people with lots of different motivations in the world. And until you start understanding that, you're never going to be able to succeed in a way that's not complete, scaring people for complete chaos. And this is just, this is just adding to that. This is just reinforcing that thought process. With yeah, what's happening it's, right now. it's a yeah. common tactic. It's, you know, it's why Don, by Martin Luther King wrote why we can't wait in the civil rights era, because white America was like, you know, you're right. But, you know, why now? Why? You're moving too fast. Wait, 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 wait. You know, and it, and it becomes that delay tactic. So I do understand where the more radical elements of our movement are saying, like, right. no, day one, day one. And I, I, I think those people definitely play a role. But I also definitely see the need for reality to intervene. And um, yeah, if you're going to say Donald, day, if you're gonna say I think one. Donald Trump illustrated yeah. it, it both ways. Mm -hmm. Where Donald Trump said, decrease, 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 and they decreased. And you know what? The drawdown that happened from December today to today, it didn't reignite World War III. Mm -hmm. And if he had done it in an even more orderly fashion, it probably would have been okay. But because he did it in such a dramatic, instant fashion, where it was look at me, look at me, it ended up being a disaster. And I think that should be the lesson for a lot of people is that, no, we shouldn't wait. We should act. But you also have to act in a way that promotes peace in the best way and promotes saving lives. Um, and there are ways, there are responsible ways to do things. And Donald Trump did not do that. Yeah. At right. least have the thought process, right? So to, to say, we're going to shut it off the next day. Fine. If you think you can do that, great. Tell me how this is going to work and how this is going to prevent this from happening and that from happening and all this chaos. If you can explain it to me and tell me you've thought about it and you have a plan and contingency for everything, okay, that's great. But nobody does that. That's the problem is you get people just getting in there and saying this stuff and never really thinking it through and just, just making things, making us, the whole movement look crazy because of it. Yeah, go ahead, Harry. 
Oh yeah, uh, that's why like you've got to think about because in order what you do, there's a human element behind it. Uh, there's are humans there. Yes, things need to happen, but like you have to understand pulling back and defunding or just taking out an agency. Like, hey, there was someone that was depending on that the day the day before, and now it's gone. What are you going to do about these people the, ne- the next day, the next week? And that's why you know like you know Andrew Yang and Yang Gang is pretty cool because. You know, if you get rid of everything and you do this DBI thing, that's easy to go like, oh, I'm going to reduce the UBI by 20, by 10% every year until it's nothing. You know, yeah. those are easy plans to do with a UBI. Sort of like miraculous of the thing like, well, how are you going to pull this out of this, of this boogaloo? You know, I have no, you know, other than just pull, pull, pull everything out. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of people see like the other thing with it is if you watch a lot of uh, Ron Paul speeches about, you know, like how you bring them in the troops room. Well, I'm just going to pull them out. That sounds great in a speech. That sounds amazing. That's what we, which everyone's probably been asking for. And it's kind of how it happened. How'd you bring them home? I'm just going to tell them to come home. This is what it is. This is what and, it looks like. And what really feeds to, to explaining that is that the way that Trump has reacted to what happened was he's kind of in shock that Turkey did this. Like he can't believe that you know they went against his wishes. He said if they did this, this was their, he was going to ruin them economically. Turkey doesn't care that you're going to ruin them economically or you're going to sanction them. They don't care because he's going to go to Russia and get what they need. They the policies are going to do that themselves. Yeah. So the fact that he was even saying, "Hey, you know, why are you upset with me for pulling them out? Nothing's going to happen. And if they do, I'll come in and fix it." He can't go in and fix it now. He's made the mess, and there's no easy fix like that. Did I do that? <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about where we're at now uh, and kind of what's happening. So the, uh, with the U.S. betrayal, the Kurds have now decided that the key to their survival may be partnering with Assad and Putin. The SDF, the, the Kurds in northern Syria, have announced that they will allow the Syrian military to move into Kurdish-controlled areas in northern Syria in order to regain sovereign, uh, Syrian sovereignty. The, because the Syrians don't want to lose that territory to Turkey. The SDF sees this as the only way to stop Turkish aggression against their forces. The deal between the Syrian government and the Kurds was brokered by the Russians, of course, while giving up their land to the Syrian government and allowing Assad to reign over northern Syria again is not preferable to the Kurds. In terms of survival, they don't really have many other options. And this was something that Trump actually floated and several others floated like, Hey, um, I don't think it was Trump. I don't think he's that astute. Um, It may have been Scott Horton. I get him confused all the time. Uh, (coughs) Excuse me. Um, Which, you know, hey, go to the Syrians, guarantee your security, and pull the Americans out. Excuse me. Um, Reinhold, what do you think about that so I can cough? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's like I said, it's just... People are like, okay, so Russia owns that area right now. What's the big deal? I said, well, then you start worrying about things like the petrodollar and how this is going to actually impact us uh, from a foreign policy standpoint. We're not going to have the power that we have. Trump thinks he's got this power now. He can just go around and and start trade wars and win them because there's so much economic power that we have. But we're on the verge of losing all of that. Russia and China are working to replace the United States as being the global you know, monetary standard, as it were. That was some top-notch libertarian bullshit right there. Thank you so much (laughs) for uh, covering. Uh, So one last interesting uh, note uh, here uh, is the U.S. troops coming under fire by the Turkish, uh, by Turkish artillery. So Turkish-backed rebels have set up checkpoints near Ain Issa, cutting off U.S. troops bases, uh, U.S. troops in bases to the west, in Manbij and Cobain. Uh, Now, these troops came under Turkish artillery fire Friday night in what some U.S. soldiers suspect was a deliberate show of force. And this may have been an attempt to get U.S. troops to back up even further away from northern Syria. Uh, Turkey, of course, states that the artillery fire was an accident. Oopsie. Uh, That's the official statement for Erdogan. Uh, Given the situation, it isn't clear that our troops present it's still tenable given the chaotic situation and severed supply lines. Uh, defense Secretary Mark Esper has already announced, who knew that Mark Esper was the Defense Secretary, has already announced that due to the pending agreement with the Kurds uh, are, that they're making with the Russians and Syrians, the remaining U.S. troops will be withdrawing from northern Syria. 
Now, as of today, October 14th, the troops are not withdrawing from Syria, just northern Syria where the Turkish forces, Syrian forces, and Kurdish forces will be colliding. Now, uh, Reason had a great article that I'll put in the show notes. Trump changes his mind about Turkey and hopes steel terrorists will stop the slaughter. Uh, he threatened to destroy their economy, which was so bizarre in his great and unmatched wisdom. It was still odd. Uh, the president, this is Elizabeth Nolan Brown writing uh, today in a Reason, Trump changes his mind. The president has declared a national emergency over the crisis he helped create in Syria. In a letter to Congress on Monday, Donald Trump announced the issue of an executive order declaring a national emergency, quote, due to the situation in in relation to Syria and in particular the recent actions by the government of Turkey to conduct a military offensive in northeast Syria. The same Turkish actions that got Trump's go-ahead last week are now described by him as a, quote, unusual and extraordinary threat to America's national security. Last week, Trump seems unconcerned about how the Turkish actions would affect the Kurdish people living there. Uh, they didn't help us win World War II, he told reporters. Uh, this week, he says the Turkish invasion of Syria will, quote, undermine the campaign to defeat ISIS and put civilians in danger and threaten the whole region's peace and stability. But Kurds whose homes are being destroyed and whose families are being displaced and slaughtered can rest assured that Trump will tax Turkish steel. The president promised to raise the tariff back up to 50%, which is where it was before getting reduced in May. Trump also said the government had stopped negotiations on a trade deal with Turkey and that it would impose sanctions against current and former officials in the Turkish government. Uh, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, friend of Jeffrey Epstein, allegedly said more sanctions were possible if Turkey is not willing to embrace a ceasefire and come to the negotiating table to, quote, end the violence. Trump himself put it less delicately, saying, I am fully prepared to swiftly destroy Turkey's economy if Turkish leaders continue to down this dangerous and destructive path. Meanwhile, uh, Erdogan has taken to the Wall Street Journal, Journal to argue Turkey has stepped up where European countries have failed. The international community, he says, missed its opportunity to prevent Syrian crisis from pulling an entire region into a maelstrom of instability. Erdogan writes, the EU and the world should support what Turkey is trying to do. Um, so this is typical of Trump. He does something incredibly boneheaded. Everybody tells him it's boneheaded, and then he goes, uh, I better tell everybody that their eyes are a mistake and tries to walk it back. Um, so that's where we're at. What's, what was permissible last week is now a national emergency. So just want to highlight a couple key points from an Andy McCarthy uh, column in National Review before we go. It's called Turkey and the Kurds. It's more complicated than you think. Um, our uh, researcher wanted you to know that this is a good read overall. Some good discussions to be based on some ideas presented inside, inside such as the PKK being on the terror watch list, uh, Turkey being a NATO ally, and it gives a devil's advocate approach to the idea of backing away from our support of the Kurds. Uh, below are some key points from this particular source. Uh, he says it is not all inclusive to the article. Most of this is directly cut and pasted from the article. I definitely did not agree with all of this article at all, but it was the best article I could find that was the quote for Trump's decision. So uh, wanting just to give you kind of the fair and balanced arguments from the other side. So <clears throat> some quote, some U.S. military officials went public with complaints about being blindsided. The policy cannot have been a surprise, though. The president has made no secret that he wants out of Syria, where we now have about 1,000 troops, down from 2,000 last year. <clears throat> More broadly, he wants our forces out of the Middle East. He ran on that position. Um, McCarthy argues against his, his endless war tropes, but his stance is popular. As for Syria specifically, many of the president's advisors think we should stay, but he has not been persuaded. Now, he continues, the president's announcement of the redeployment of the troops in Syria came on the heels of a phone conversation with President Erdogan. As has become rote, the inevitable criticism was followed by head-scratching tweets. The president vows to totally destroy and obliterate the economy of Turkey, which I've done before. What? <laughs> now, if Turkey takes any actions, quote, that I, in my great and unmatched wisdom, 
considered to be off limits. We can only sigh and say it will be interesting to see how the president backs up these haughty threats now that Erdogan has be begun his in invasion. So he's going to threaten to destroy the economy of another country with tariffs. No, that's only happening to our economy. Uh, so it, it, it's so boneheaded that this guy is threatening to destroy another country by putting a 50% tariff on steel. Like, that's such a pinprick. Like, it's not even close. Like, it's just so dumb. He's such a dummy. Yeah, of their steel to us. <laughs> right. Like, how much, how much steel Wait. did they sell us? Like, I'm which sure it's not. We had to pay more for it, which means it's a tax on the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the tax on Turkey is a tax on the United States, and the tax was intended to destroy their economy. Exactly. Right. That's the one thing in that quote I wanted to ask about and bring up is that when he says, I've done it before, what is he when has he done it before? Right. What is he talking about? I don't even know where in his mind he could be getting that from. Right. So let's go back to uh, Annie McCarthy's points. Um, the first support given to a pullout of the U.S. troops in North Syria presented in this article is the fact that President Trump wants U.S. forces out of a conflict in which America's interests have never been clear and for which Congress has never approved military intervention. Totally true. Uh, like I said earlier, we have no idea who the good guys or bad guys are, and so therefore we end up becoming the bad guys. Uh, McCarthy also takes note of the fact that everyone keeps referring to North Syria as Kurdish territory, but it is still Syrian territory at the end of the day and not its own nationalistic uh, territory. Um, the PKK is technically on the foreign terrorist organization list under U.S. law for its insurgent warfare against Turkey for the past 30 years, so that makes our support for them more complicated. Now, while the PKK is on the terrorist list, Turkey is a NATO ally. Should both of these things remain the same? Should Turkey remain in NATO for its strategic value, or should the PKK remain relegated to the ranks of known terrorist organizations? The author states that while it is a longer discussion, he would be open to considering the removal of both the PKK from the terrorist list and Turkey from NATO. So for now, though, the blunt facts are that the PKK is a terrorist organization and Turkey is our ally. Uh, these are not mere technicalities. So as are the Kurds. So there are two allies in this equation, and our support for one has already vexed the other. The ramifications are, ter are serious, not least... Turkey's continued, continued lurch away from NATO and towards Moscow. Remember, NATO was formed to fight the Soviet Union and the Russians. Uh, Turkey played a, an important role uh, in, in NATO and is kind of abandoning that. So McCarthy writes, without any public debate, the Obama administration in 2014 insinuated our nation into the Kurdish-Turk conflict by arming the YPG. Remember, all of this vexation that we're going through now and arguments that we're having now were caused by the Americans at some point. This just happened to be Obama in 2014 this time. To be sure, our intentions were good. ISIS had besieged the city of Kobani in, the northern, in northern Syria, but Turkey understandably regards the YPG as a terrorist organization complicit in the PKK insurgency. Our intervention in Syria has never been authorized by Congress. Those of us who oppose the intervention maintain that congressional authorization was necessary because there was no imminent threat to our nation. Having U.S. forces deter further genocidal bloodshed in northern Syria is not a mission for which Americans support committing our men and women. In uniform, such bloodlettings are the Muslim Middle East default condition, so the missions would never end. And that's where Donald Trump, as Tom Woods in a discussion with Scott Horton, was very correct in saying, if, if I were president, I would sit down in an Oval Office speech, I would explain my rationale and tell the American people that the Kurds are not worth one special forces young man, no father should be crying tomorrow because his son died. Uh, conservatives would be appealed to that. The, the non-interventionist leaning left if they are in existence still, uh, would bite on that. And the American public would probably support it if he did that instead of just yelling on Twitter like a crazy person. Um, a congressional debate should have been mandatory before we jumped into a multi-layered war featuring anti-American actors and shifting loyalties on both sides. In fact, so complex is the situation that Obama's initial goal was to oust serious, serious Assad regime. 
Only later, they pivoted to fighting terrorists, which helped Assad. That is Syria, opposing one set of Americans' enemies only to empower another. More clear than what intervention would accomplish was the likelihood of becoming enmeshed, inadvertently or otherwise, in vicious conflicts of which we wanted no part, such as the notorious and long-standing conflict between the Turks and Kurds. Now, McCarthy continues, the Kurds, however, are very capable. There was no clamor on Capitol Hill to back them. We knew from the first, though, that supporting them was a time bomb. Turkey was never going to countenance a Kurdish autonomous zone led by YPG and PKK elements on its Syrian border. Anarka, Turkey's capital, was already adamant that the PKK was using the Kurdish autonomous zone in Iraq to encourage separatist uprisings in Turkey, where 20% of the population is Kurdish. Erdogan would never accept a similar arrangement in Syria. He would evict the YPG forcibly if it came to that. So yes, we had humanitarian reasons for arming the Kurds, but doing so undermined our anti-terrorism laws while giving Erdogan incentive to align with Russia and mend fences with Iran. Now we've encouraged the Kurds to align with uh, Iran and Russia and tur the Turks are aligned with Iran and Russia. So it's very confusing there. Um, ISIS, meanwhile, has never been defeated. It's lost its territorial caliphate, but it was always more lethal as an underground terrorist organization as, uh, as it was a quasi-sovereign struggle, struggling uh, to hold territory. So uh, ISIS really, the, it wasn't Donald Trump that defeated ISIS. What most people need to understand is that it's very easy to be a guerrilla warfare um, much like the American founding, it was easier to defeat the British than it was to form a constitution after 11 years. Uh, so it is very hard to govern. So when you're ISIS and you can spout off and recruit and shoot from the sidelines, but then when you actually have to govern and feed people and remit justice, it became very difficult. And that's what ultimately led to the collapse of ISIS because people don't like to be ruled over and they start to fight back against the rulers. Um, it wasn't the American military or really any military that, that completely quashed ISIS. The bulk of the work was done by the people being ruled by the caliphate. So although Al-Qaeda has rarely spoken in recent years, it is ascendant and is threatening as it has been. And now McCarthy says, as threatening as it has been at any time since pre-9-11. Okay, whatever. Those of us opposed to intervention in Syria wanted Congress to think through the quite predictable outcomes before authorizing any U.S. military involvement in this wretched region. Congress, however, much prefers to lay low in the tall grass, wait for presidents to act, and then complain when things go awry. So I apologize for monopolizing the four of you. You two are very quiet, but it seems to me that this, after we have looked at this and studied this, it seems our chickens have come home to roost. And the president is taking a lot of heat, rightly so, for the way that he has handled this. But the people that are escaping are the Lindsey Grahams and the, the interventionists from the get-go. It has been our foreign policy that's actually been the problem and not just the actual, uh, the way that Trump did this is not great. But the problem is that we were there in the first place. All right, we were there in the first place. And um, I just, I have this problem with buying his motivations on wanting to withdraw troops from the Middle East when he's sending more troops over to Saudi Arabia. He's funding and helping Saudi Arabia kill thousands of Yemenis uh, all, you know, on a daily basis almost. It's, it just it just kind of confuses me as to are, are they learning the lessons they need to be learning at this point that we really shouldn't be doing those things like sending all the, the troops to Saudi Arabia and doing what we're doing over there. If, if we don't want the situation that we have in Syria to happen again, why are we continuing to do those things there? Right. And that's that's why I, don't th I think the disconnect is, is that nobody's really learning the lessons that they need to be learning from this. Um, Trump isn't learning anything, obviously, about how he should, you know, kind of think about things before he does them. And then nobody who's in power, who's an interventionalist or a neocon or any of those people are taking anything away from this other than bolstering their own belief, as Lindsey Graham uh, wrote about the Obama libertarian foreign policy, I think is what he said. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, no, um, no, that's, that's not even close to being anywhere near correct. Uh, uh, on, it's some oxymoron more than anything. Um, but they're not, they're just bol bolstering their own positions. They're, they're not learning anything. They're just going to continue doing and going down this path that they've gone down before because they think they're in the right. Harry. And they've got everybody cheering for it now. So, yeah, right. they haven't learned anything for it. And you are right. The people who put everything in motion, you know, aren't taking any heat from it. They just, you know, like, wow, let's take this, you know, this awful situation we created, this albatross of a situation, tie it around Trump's neck, and man, look, now we're clean. It's like laundering the guilt. Right. And, guilt if you, and if you look at the people who are upset now, and the crocodile tears that they have, like the Lindsey mm -hmm. Grahams, who I have no uh, – Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham can both just walk off a cliff. Um, they weren't upset about what we were doing to the children on the border. They weren't upset about the con consistently – and uh, the lies that, that Trump tells daily mm -hmm. that – uh, on things that are so obviously verifi verifiable that they're lies, right? He, he right. just doesn't even think about it. He just lies and lies and lies, whatever he goes in his head, mm -hmm. following conspiracy theories, believing the QAnon stuff, all that stuff is going on. And these people are saying nothing. They're defending him for two and a half years. But the minute he touches their foreign policy the way he that they want it to be, that's when they're upset. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. So it tells you where their primary focus is. They don't care. Trump doesn't care. None of these people care about anything other than their own power and their own sense of right and wrong and uh, the rest of the world be damned. Right. Just fucking kill him, right? Yeah. Uh, you guys up for it? Huh? Uh, kill him? Uh, what? What? <laughs> you're on that one. You're completely you're on, joking. On, you're on your own. Um, <laughs> I will say, like, there's also good, like, um, almost, you know, uh, this is a good roadmap for when a uh, Libertarian Party finally gets off its ass and elects a president against uh, president elected is this is what's going to happen. LOL. You know, <laughs> this is what will, you know, this is what will happen to a libertarian president. Probably worse. They probably be impeached in the first six months, but this is what they would do to you. You know, you could have the best intention. You could try to do all this thing, but this is what they're going to do to you. When you start doing anything, every bad thing they're going to, that you may have not a cause the situation, but they're going to take it and they're going to tie it around your neck and you're going to wear this. Uh-huh. Well, they did. It's the same thing. I mean, Jimmy Carter came in as a non-interventionist type of person, and he got thrust into a, a terrible situation. Bush came in wanting to end our entanglements and try to, you know, not fight all these wars in all these places. And 9-11 hit him. I mean, there's all these things happen uh, to these presidents that they don't expect when they get in there. And then they're not equipped to deal with it because they didn't think about it ahead of time. Right. All right, let's start wrapping up. Uh, let's do final thoughts. Uh, Reinhold, final thoughts for the episode. Final thoughts is I want there to be peace in the world. I want us to stop creating all of these problems that we have been doing for the past uh, 100 years. Um, but I want us to do it in a way that understands the fact that we have created these problems and we are there and we are involved in these areas. So let's, do, let's get to where we want to be, but do it in a way that's not... Um, going to lead to mass murder of thousands to millions of people. Let's, let's try to do this. Let's try to think it through. Let's try to be smart. Let's try to understand the thinking behind these people and understand their motivations and why they're doing it and address those in a way that is fair and equitable to everybody and then get out and let them handle their own mess. Right. Uh, the, you know, let's, let's fix the problems we created and get out and let them handle the rest of it on their own. But until we take an, uh, ownership of what we've done, until we start to even try to understand their motivations, uh, we're just asking for trouble. Harry? Um, this is, while this is an interesting situation, one thing I wanted to like highlight is to let people know that a lot of the Hong Kong protests, they're still happening. The Yellow Vest movement is still happening. So understand that the world is a massive place. and There's a lot of stuff that's going on right now, not just in this one different region. Um, 
but most wall listeners probably are already aware of that. There's tons of things going on at one time. So uh, the yellow vest stuff usually only just happens on weekends. Really uh, interesting stuff that you're going to view, watch, especially on some live streams, uh, see everything that's going on in that situation. Um, the other thing that's going on this is in my personal life is that uh, I'm finally um, over Brett leaving me. Um, I went to brunch by myself. And, oh, cool. uh, yeah, went brunch on my foot, went yoga by myself, you know, without Brett, you know, it's, you know, it's hard, but I did it, okay? <laughs> I bet it was hard when you went with Brett, too. <clears throat> well, <laughs> yeah, because we would compete, you know, like for poses, like we were supposed mm-hmm. to, we like, it almost like made uh, yoga, you know, competitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Right well, over his head there, I think. I've said everything that I thought, so I don't have any final thoughts. I just, uh, it's nice to... <laughs> Nice to be here. Nice to talk to you guys. I'm so, very, I was very worked up about all this, so it's, right. I feel like calm and relaxed now. Cool. So let's now let's talk about the Democratic uh, the debate it. tonight. Oh, right. Got the hit that lead, oh, hit this, Harry, let's hit the button. button too. Where's the button? Harry, <laughs> do you even give half a fuck about the Democrats? Just Yang, Andrew Yang, Yang Gang. I don't care about the Libertarians, let alone the Democrats. Yeah, it, it's parents are running somebody anyway. So I mean, that's the 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 Who knows? About it. So it it's really not until it gets closer to the actual primary and election. It's is all stage theater. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm gonna be real honest with this audience and you guys. I'm having a really hard time caring at all. <laughs> like I just am. I don't just sort of over all of this. Yeah, yeah. You're really, you're really good. Um, super scandal to get involved in to really pull you back in right so yeah, right. The, the fact that now we have john bolton um uh being the you know, getting his uh revenge on trump is going to be an interesting thing to watch to me so those are the types of things that keep me engaged and keep me involved right. is seeing the interplay between two horrible people and you know who's going to come out on top on that one yeah All right. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you uh, being here and everybody for listening. And I won't delay it any further. Thank you. You have a great week. Next week, we'll be with Al Jackson. And then after that, we're going to be back. We'll probably talk about Ukraine. I will have tried to build up enough fucks to talk about impeachment and Ukraine. I will probably have Dennis back because he cares for some reason. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll give you an explanation on the Ukraine stuff and then why it matters. It's history um, I, in the making. I just like this to me is what this episode. Like you can't you can't call the generals in the area. They impeach you. But uh, I don't know. Trump being Trump just doesn't get my get the hitch in my giddy up to be honest anymore. So, all right, guys, we will uh, talk to you about that at a future date. And uh, thanks for watching and listening. That was a YouTube special. You hold that in. Luciana's, man. Can I tell you something else? I want you to know.